I've been a photographer here in New York since uh, 1975 and uh, been shooting images since I was eight. I think my father gave me a, one of those Instamatics, you load the little 126 in. Um, it's actually the very first roll of film that I, that I developed a little you know, camera thing at, at high school and uh, the, photo the photography quote teacher didn't really know what he's doing, stuck you in the dark room and I opened this thing up and I cracked the, the thing open and nobody told me that there was backing on film. <laughs> so I didn't know which was the film and which was the backing. But there was a little light leak at the bottom of the door, so I went down and <laughs> figured it out. Ah, this is the film, and you know, I don't I have no idea what those negatives look like. Um, so I photograph everything that I possibly can get involved in. So I've been on aircraft carriers. I've been all over the world doing travel, advertising, corporate. Uh, you name it, whatever I can get involved in because I love to hear the shutter click on a camera. It's just wonderful. I still shoot with my M6, which is, uh, I have Tri-X film in it. I still have my darkroom. Everybody calls that the you know old school. Well, those are tools. Nobody ever told the, the painter to get rid of his uh, horsehair brush because it was old school. So um, today what I wanted to do was to take you into into my world of nonprofit. And I say my world because anybody that does nonprofit work is totally different from the other person because it's their own experience, it's what they've created, it's projects that they're trying to do. So what happens on their trips is most likely very unique. Um, there are very specific things that you need to do which I'll talk about and help you out. Um, but the main thing is desire. The desire to get out there, to bring the story home. I always felt that if someone gave $30,000 to run a mission, wouldn't they want to know what went on during that mission? Uh, did they, were they all just having a party and drinking beer in the airport and they never ever actually went to the place? Um, so when I go on the mission, you can't really, the, the mission can't really lie because I've photographed just about every inch of that mission to bring it home. So there's, the, the first video I want to show you um, is literally one minute long and it's, it's used to promote the, the, the next coming mission and to hope to get donor, donors to donate. Um, to me, it's one of the one minute, no editing, no nothing, and it's the, one of the top oral facial surgeons in, in the world uh, does this. And twice a year, he goes to Bangladesh and does 50 surgeries in four days with a crew of 15. Um, and it's just amazing. So I just want to show you this. in southern Bangladesh. Tell it to me again. Look at the camera. So people ask why we come. And Sanatola, I think, is a good example of that. 12 years old with an incredibly wide cleft lip. So if anyone asks why or wonders why we come, this is why because we can make a difference in his life in a one hour, two hour surgery. So that's, that's, this is why we come. If that doesn't explain it, all my other photographs and everything else, all my other stories really, really can't do much. Um, this, is a, this is a list of just some of the stuff that I've done over the last um, 10 years. One organization gets me into another. Somebody on that trip has done something somewhere else. And they say, hey, that's great. Let's go. Let's go do this. Let's go do that. Except for my dentist. My dentist actually put a place in, uh, in the Domin Dominican Republic. They're building a clinic. 
uh, for dentistry, and uh, I kept saying, you've got to get me down there to photograph. Uh, we'll, we'll raise money. We'll get down there to photograph. He says, no, no, we're not ready yet. We're not ready yet. And, he, and I said, well, who's going to take the pictures? He says, I'm him. And I go, oh, that's great. And I'm sitting in the dentist chair talking to him at the time. And, and I said, okay, how many hands does it take to do a root canal on this kid that you're doing? He goes, two. And I said, now which hand are you going to use to photograph what you're doing? <laughs> and he goes, oh, oh okay. Uh, I still haven't made it to the Dominican Republic with him. And actually, in the Dominican Republic, they probably really need his help right now. Um, so um, this is a list of things that I've done just recently in the last 10 years or so. And in November, I'm off to um, Sri Lanka with Dr. Z, who is a doctor you saw there, um, to, with, a, with a team of 20 doctors. We're going to do uh, facial burns from the war and some cleft, some cleft work. You always have, you know, this is, this is my selfie. I actually didn't take it. A Jordanian photographer took it of me. And we're sitting just in, in uh, um, Nafra near, um, in Jordan, right near the Syrian camps. And these are Syrian refugees. Um, and and the, the woman there is the woman I'm photographing for. In, in Bangladesh, the rice fields, down to the bottom, and the, and the kids just absolutely love it. If it I feel like the Pied Piper, I just step outside, and within 30 feet, I've got 50 kids behind me. So, one of the things as a photographer, being able to go to places such as Bangladesh, uh, the West Bank, China, wherever, are in absolutely incredible places. Not only to document what these doctors are doing, but to create photographs. So it affords me a lot of time after the, after the mission. Um, India, the old trains that are in Calcutta that the British left behind. Um, I'm in another boat following, and this is the, the ferry boat that goes back and forth across in, uh, um, in India. I developed a, a, a nonprofit uh, to find out if we can take uh, missions into Pakistan. So this is wheat thrashing in, in Pakistan. Uh, China, again, doing the orphans in China. Um, when I came back from this, it, it Sprint, you remember that, that thing that Sprint did with the different towers showing how powerful their image was, how, how their signal was? And I, and I thought this would be a great ad for them. But um, So really, my documentation started in the, in the early 90s. Um, after doing tons and tons of catalog and shooting tons and tons and tons of film, through uh, to do to do the stuff. I purchased a home, an old historical home in Sherman, Connecticut. And for whatever reason, I just started photographing the town and um, the people, the events, everything that that went on. Um, they have their five-minute parade every Memorial Day. Um, and uh, it's each year it's it's different and, and even more wonderful. Um, the personal people of the town, and then about 14 years later, I had a show in the town of about 200, 300 prints in five different locations all over the town. So it was kind of my my kind of not give back, but to show to show what I've done. During, before I was, when I was prepping that show, I was printing the, the, the uh, posters for the show and I'm standing in the printer and this woman was standing there and she was doing this, these printers. I said, ah, what, what are you doing? She says, oh, I'm, I'm promoting a trip to Cambodia for a dental mission. I said, oh, that's interesting. Uh, you know, do they need a photographer? You know, I'd love to check that out. And she says, ah, well, give me a call. Well, about two months later, I was in Cambodia. Now, this is, this is the, this, after 30 years of photography, I, threw, I thought I knew everything until I got off the plane in Cambodia with polo shirts that were cotton, a suitcase without wheels on it, 
a lousy camera bag, but good equipment that I had in the bag. And I learned more on that trip than you can imagine. Um, cotton is horrible in humid weather. <laughs> Wear shirts like this, which are these, these uh, uh, Under Armour shirts are incredible. Your, your suitcase, instead of being this big, is about this big. And then you get to put other photo equipment in instead of more shirts. You bring a little three ounce thing of uh, detergent and you wash your shirt at night and you hang it up. Next day it's a nice clean shirt and you go on. You're not, you're, not on a, you're not on vacation and you're not on a fashion um, exhibition. You're, on, you're there to photograph. The guys are, the doctors are there in scrubs the whole time so what, you don't need to be dressed up. You just need to be comfortable. Uh, and because you're going to see things, things are going to happen that you thought you'd never look at and you probably won't want to look at it a second time. We, pu we had 700 kids, we pulled 600 teeth. And they're little, unfortunately, they're little girls like this who had rotted teeth across the top from sucking on um, sugar cane, stuff like that but they get married at about 15 or 16. If they don't have a, a set of teeth, even if they're rotted, they won't get married. And they won't be able to be supported on and on and on. This is basically a mass unit. So as a photographer, you walk into these places and that's it. They, you can't go, hey, can you move the table over here? Can you do this? Can you, let's get the lighting here. No, you get what you get. Um, I even sat down with this doctor here and and put the camera down and started handing him tools, put my mask on and, and, and actually got involved. And it's literally, as, as you see it, this is a school of 2,500 kids and, and the, the kid would sit in the chair, either get his tooth pulled or worked on or whatever, and they put a, a soccer ball, a deflated soccer ball behind their head as the, you know, like in a doctor's office to keep your head still. And then afterwards, make them feel good, pump the soccer ball, and let them go play with it. Um, unfortunately, with, with cavities, it's very, very dangerous because it's very close to your brain, and infection is, it can kill you instantly. So walking around without a tooth is better than that rotted tooth. Um, and working with these doctors, I mean, this guy's a uh, trauma surgeon in Brooklyn. What does he need to go to Bangladesh, uh, to Cambodia for? Uh, he's got a full service down in, in Houston, Texas. What does he need to go there? He goes there because of desire. He goes there to give back. Walking into doors that, that, that you have no idea what's on the other side. Um, it's darker than it is outside, so you make sure that you set up your camera for the ISO. I shoot with a 1DX. If anybody's ever shot with a 1DX, the Canon 1DX, you can shoot literally in the dark with this camera. But if you're not prepared for it, and you walk in, and you're sitting there futzing with your camera, you're going to miss the shot because this only happens once. Um, so preparation, now see I'm now outside again. See how dark it is inside? I still shoot, as I said, black and white film and I love black and white film. It, it scans nicely, it makes wonderful prints in the dark room. Um, so it's kind of my, my art. So on most of the trips I do shoot black and white. I call this the Cambonia minivan. They are actually waiting for mom to come with the groceries and then they'll, then they'll go home. And she will actually fit on that bike. Um, brothers, they probably have no mother or father. So Smile Bangladesh is the, the, the head doctor. And by the way, that in the video in the beginning, he was actually crying. So it affects him so much. That, that, and, and he's an oral facial surgeon that, that does thousands of, of these, but it affects him more out of the United States than it does in. Um, so we did um, three cleft missions in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Bangladesh. Uh, this was a video that I produced for the NASDAQ 
um, building in Times Square. It's a seven-story building, and every, everybody's seen that. They have all these ads running on it. Well, there's a way of doing a video. So I learned in about five days, because we rang the bell of the NASDAQ, and there would be windows in all different parts, so you had to have your photographs created. So not only do you go photograph places, when you get back, opportunities open up for you to learn how to do uh, lots of different things. Oh, I gotta get this thing to move. Okay. Oh, oh sorry. So again, the doctor right after the surgery, more important to have, you know, to have, the, of course, is football team on his hat. So I get involved in, uh, again, you have to know, you can't, this, this next trip that I'm doing into Sri Lanka, I, I'm actually gonna bring some additional lighting with me. Because it's very hard, the light that lights the, the uh, for the doctors is probably three stops or four stops brighter than the ambient light of the room. So that's why it's so dark. Um, but to me, this is very effective and very um, informative the way it is. The, the uh, anesthesiologist has prepped the child. Now, to the left here is a window, wide open window. The fan's going around, the flies are going around. But the fact that this child is getting the cleft repaired, which is the devil in the child, once you repair the cleft, the devil has gone. He gets his life back. So that's, the, that's what we're after. Again, she had her, ch her child have the cleft repaired, came out of the OR. The OR is all bloody and all sewn up. She was all ready to go, what did you do to my child? And then she realized the child didn't have a cleft anymore. And so she's crying with happiness. Learning, learning other cultures is very, very important. In uh, Muslim culture, you, women have to have their heads wrapped. Well, they don't all the time. If there isn't a man around, they take it off. It's 100 degrees, it's hot. So I made the mistake of going in the recovery area and all of a sudden, the women are putting their head, and I go, wait a second, that's not really respectful of what's going on. So the next time, I kind of stuck my camera like this in the doorway. And you hear all this rustling going on, and the rustling stops, and I walk in, and all the women have their head, head dressed the way they want them. And I could photograph any of them they want, because they knew that what I was doing was helping their child. But I needed to respect them, and they therefore respected me. When you're on a, on a mission, it's your project, it's your idea. You're not going to make a lot of money doing this. Don't think this is a, you know, I, I fundraise for it, I use frequent flyer miles. Um, I do whatever I can to, to, to help out. So it's very important to, to know in the beginning, find the people that are going, the kids that are going to be worked on, do some images, and then, then photograph them afterwards. This is what's going to bring money to the organization in order for them to do the next mission. Because people go, OK, yeah, there's a poor kid with the cleft. But what happens later? They actually get repaired. Such as this guy, 60 years old. I think this is one of the oldest guys that has cleft repaired. And we asked him, well, 60 years, what? And he says, well, my, my wife died three years ago, and I want to get remarried. <laughs> Unfortunately, clefts are hereditary. So in, uh, and in Bangladesh or third world countries, nutrition is, makes it even worse. So it's a one in 500 in Bangladesh and one in 1,000 in the United States. Once the child has is, is been uh, operated on, they're given to the, to the mother. The mother is now taking responsibility all over again. If she sees something's wrong or the little uh, heart monitor starts beeping the wrong way, the nurse will come back, but the nurse has actually gone back to do the, yet the next child. 50 surgeries, just think of it, 50 surgeries, six surgeons in four days. So you have got six, three tables to, to photograph. 
you have got everything else outside because we take the child home. Now this is this is like graduation. The child is now the the devil is no longer in the child. It gets to go back into society. Well, what do you do as a photographer? Do you sit at the at the clinic and say, "Oh, this is lovely," or do you get in the ambulance and say and have them say, "Well, where, what are you doing here?" Says, "I'm going with you." Do you know where you're going? No, I don't, but I'm following you. I end up at this uh, child's home to be able to photograph his grandmother and his brother see that he no longer has a cliff. To me, this is the reward of dragging my butt around for <laughs> in the hot heat and humid. Doesn't matter once I see this and able to photograph this. This little girl had her, her uh, cleft done about two years prior. Most of the time, as we all have heard, well, it's true, the, the, the oldest daughter usually takes care of the younger kids. The next kid that comes up to you and complains that his iPhone's not working, <laughs> ask him why he's not smiling like the kid with a cleft. I asked my daughter that a number of times. Pay attention. Pay attention to everything. I mean, how, how ingenious can it be that the mother's exhausted sleeping, but she knows she's got to keep the kid in, in place, so the way that the kid sleeps on her legs. But it makes, it, to me, a great photograph. These lips will be these lips will be fine in a couple of days. It's just from the from the surgery. And this this little kid, this is our rock star. He is the biggest pain in the butt, but uh, oh, he was a monster. But almost didn't get it. If we if it wasn't the fact that you put him under during the surgery, <laughs> probably he never would have gotten done. Again, the very the smallest things tell the biggest stories. So that was that was Smile Bangladesh in ba in, Bang in Bangladesh. In the, then there's things that happen. We met the doctor's uh, uncle who hadn't seen in 30 years. So he shows up at the airport with the extended family, 15 people. Oh, fantastic! We had a great time, and we're gonna have we're gonna have a party for you on on next Friday when you come back from such and such. You come over here. 250 people are going to show up. Oh, it's wonderful, fantastic time. He died on Wednesday. I, because I was with the team, his team, I was allowed to photograph this funeral. This is the his his cousin, cousin, the mother, um, and the uncle. When are you ever going to get the chance to do that on a, re on a regular without connections? So the other thing is connections is, is what's getting me to all these places. And to figure out, now I'm shooting video, I'm shooting s color, and I'm shooting black and white film. And I'm walking backwards, and there's 200 people behind here. And it is very, very important that you are the pole bearer of your friend. So as they're walking along, these guys are fighting each other to be the pole bearer. And they didn't care less. If, they, if I didn't move out of the way, they would walk me right over because they needed to hold on to, if it was just for a second. So this is, <laughs> which is the girl? The one with the, with the jewelry. But this is the whole thing with these children, with nutrition. Now, luckily, these, none of these children had any, uh, any clefts, but the, the, the deformities from them comes in the malnutrition. And they're, and they're probably um, two to three years older than you think they are. Walking down the street. I'm sitting, how many pictures can I t do in an OR? How many times can I take a picture of the doctor doing this, doctor doing this? Getting out into the, into the community and walking down the street. 
hearing the kids in a school, going into the school. There's probably 120 kids in this class, unfortunately. Um, but is it, is it like taking advantage of them and photographing them? I don't think so because it was a, something that I gave them during that day. I, 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 I photographed them, I, I brought myself to them, and they brought themselves to me. So kind of a little trade-off, and they'll probably remember it for the rest of their life. And I'm here photographing the back. I'm very quiet. You don't make a big noise. You don't disturb the thing. But he's saying, hello, how are you? And it's the English class. So someone who speaks English or just walked into the room where they're having an English class. So things happen, and wonderful things happen. Unfortunately, horrible things happen also. So you have to be prepared both ways. So I went into, again, one, one mission feeds into another. I went into China on a, on a cleft mission with 29, with a group of 29. And China has got its, its uh, political situations, and we got into a hospital that was for young adults, 16-year-olds that were having facial surgery to change their looks. Um, and it was the only hospital we could get into. And unfortunately, the, the equipment of the hospital was too much for the lungs of the younger children that we had to work on. Um, and so we were, had to turn away certain ones. But later on, we got them to another hospital, and they were able to fix. But the whole, the whole uh, political situation was very, um, very stressful. Um, it made it hard to photograph, um, but I was able to, to do it just by blending in, being part of the group, um, and I learned, learned a tremendous amount. This child, we tried to, they, they stayed with us for four days and never got his, his cleft fixed until about a month later where we arranged it at another hospital for the, for the parents. Because if the, if the anesthesiologist had used the machines for the older kids or the older adults, it would have exploded their lung too much power. And I was on this mission, I was actually um, being, my expenses and everything were paid by, by this doctor. Um, so that he could promote his work that he was doing. So in the north, <clears throat> doing the clef, that kind of that kind of ran out because there was no more kids. They didn't they didn't promote the thing correctly. And I said, what else do you do? And they they do um, they take care of orphans in the south. So I said, fly me there, get me there. So I travel for a week around southern China. Uh, into different homes, the children who didn't have parents that had died or, or in jail or whatever, they were staying with relatives. And so they were orphans, not in an orphanage, but in all different areas of the. And so the, the guy that was taking me around was taking food or clothing and a Bible to each one of the kids, and I followed him. He's standing in his living room, and there's an open ceiling to the to the front part and behind here is the is a kitchen and then the and the barn and the rooms are off to the side so the the guy I was with had brought him a basketball and I was like going he didn't have a basketball now what's he going to do with a basketball um, but that's all he had to bring him so So she's, she's probably 15 with her, her grandmother, who's 80. So it was kind of uh, tough on the, on the relatives, but was the only way that the child had any place to live. So a lot of people ask, well, oh, it's nice that you go off to the other parts. Well, what about home? Well, I do at home. So my, my friend worked as a doctor for the disadvantaged children, um, Down syndrome out in, on Long Island. So 
the regulations in the United States are a lot tougher to deal with, especially photographically. But I was able to go there, and they put on the most incredible Halloween costume party that you could ever see. It was absolutely amazing. Um, again, using your equipment, knowing what you're, you know, you, obviously you need to have things sharp, but you're, you're with, the, with the cameras today, shooting raw, being able to balance your, your files, opens up a whole new world. Because you're, you're sitting here with daylight and lighting from a gym. Who knows what that lighting is? So once you know your equipment and you're very, very comfortable with it, it doesn't matter anymore. You know what the situation's going to, what you need to do to make the situation work. Again, in the United States, St. Baldrick's, you shave your head and raise money Hey, Joe, I'm going to shave my head. Will you give me five bucks? And you go, go, and you try to get as much money as you can. You're supporting the kid that has cancer for his treatment. And, and the, your payment is you get hair. And women with nice long hair, their head shaved. Unfortunately, some of the kids that you run into this is just it's heartbreaking, just absolutely, you just no, the stories behind it are horrible. But the whole idea of him shaving his head is that he feels now comfortable with the situation. And this was his dad, and every time he raised his money to shave his head. The uh, Central Park Horse Patrol, every year they shave their heads. This is the 19th precinct down on, uh, on uh, 70th Street in, uh, in Lexington. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. But this is the sergeant on the 19th, I mean, the top guy. And, um, and, and one of these guys here, I think him, was the, the assistant of the day. And, he, and the sergeant said, give me your, your handcuffs. He handed them to the little kid and says, who do you want to put the handcuffs on? And the little kid turns around and goes, you. <laughs> so I have pictures of the sergeant <laughs> in handcuffs with his entire team, bald-headed team, around him. One of the stories from here, which was horrible, and, and this is where you have to be prepared to listen, photograph, know when to photograph and when not to photograph, when to sit and help and not help. Because you know, I'm not a doctor, so I know nothing about it, but I, I'm a photographer, so I can do my job and let the, the doctor do his job. One of the kids and one of these where we're shaving, we get a whole group together, the barbers come in and shave, and the little boy had a full head of hair. And his heroes, his 19th precinct were getting their heads shaped and he turned to mom and he said I want my head shaved and mom said no 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 I can't do that because mom if, if the kid's head is shaved it means the kid has cancer he's in chemo because he's lost his hair but his heroes were getting their heads shaved so he had it so they stuck him in the sh chair and they shaved his head not a, not a dry eye in the place, because it was the, now the reverse. Um, it, was, it was amazing. Again, and I have, a, I have a, a couple books over here that have different things that I've done. Aging out of the foster care. We took five, and get involved with other photographers. We got five photographers and five writers. Each writer <coughs> wrote about a specific child and the photographer had to create the photographs, and then we produced a book. And we did a Kickstarter uh, to, to produce the book and to give the organization um, about $6,000 out of the whole project. So it was a very, it was a great collaboration outside of photography. It got you to work with a writer, it got you a book, it got you a, lo a, lot, of, a lot of nice stuff. 
so he was one of the ones he had you know he's I think he was 19 here at 18 you've, you've lived in an institution your whole life in a dormitory where they're kids your whole life and at 18 they say goodbye you have no idea how to pay rent you have no idea how to make your own bed you have no idea how to get a job or anything you're just out the door so the organization get grabs these kids and helps them. I couldn't, unfortunately, couldn't photograph. It would have been great to be able to photograph the 13 or 12 year old and show the plight of the 12 year old, but the state of New York will not allow that. So we couldn't photograph until 18. So that's even another situation. How do you, how do you give back when there's too many regulations to s stopping you? So we did it and we told the story of the kids through the older kids so he's got his own apartment and everything else he also had not seen a dentist god knows how long and i got him connected with a, a dentist who who unfortunately pulled a few teeth and stuff like that um so there's more things you can do than just uh just take pictures So fundraising, everybody goes, how the hell you, how the heck do you pay for this? You know, so if it says Visa on the door, I use my Visa card. I don't care if it's $2, $2. So they take my Visa card. I'm going to pay, pay cash anyways. So I might as well use the Visa card. And um, that gives me frequent flyer miles. I create ads of, of my work and you, the organizations, the different organizations use that to promote the next trip. Now, the bad part of this whole thing is I have these, these ads, they're sitting on the, on the table, the guys sitting there were talking about doing promotion for their next piece. And he's told me that you can't, we can't pay you for the mission, you gotta raise your own money, okay? So I said, okay, well, let's see if we can raise money using the ads. It's fine. All of a sudden, he gets a phone call. Big smile on his face, puts the phone down, says, I just got three donations of 10,000 each. Well, that's about as much as you need for a mission. And I look at him, and now remember, these ads are on the table, right? They're sitting on the table. And I said, now we got money to produce photographs, to build your website, to." raise money and he goes the donor said we can't use the money for photography uh, like why says that they say that photography does not help the children if this ad did not have the children in it how good is the ad the the, the smile train you those ads you see with the cleft lip in the station, that they only show this much. They raise millions of dollars because of that photograph. So you have to kind of balance between people telling you no and you figuring out how to make it yes. And I've done a lot and I've gone tremendous places in the world which I would never have gone to if I hadn't put my effort into it um, and taken photographs that I have never would be able to take any other way. Um, I am with APA, I'm a uh, member of APA and a, on the board, and I produce the magazine proof sheet, which I have a, a dummy of it up here. Um, and this is all on nonprofit. If you go to APA NY, um, you'll see it on there, or ISU, I-S-S-U-U dot com slash APA NY. You'll see all our magazines. But eight photographers have talked about their different nonprofits that they worked for. Um, so it gives a, a great information and uh, photographs. So now we're back on the other side of the world again. I, ICMC. Standing outside Zatry Camp, which is here behind us. Um, at the moment, there's about 22,000 people inside, but every day between 1 and 4,000 people cross from the border of Syria over there. You were talking about the uh, school children. What's tell me that? What's going on with that? As far as I know, there's about seven thousand kids at the moment of school age inside the camp. 
and until about last week the government of Jordan promised that all the children would be able to go up to the state schools in Mafrak, which is about 20-30 minutes drive down the road. Um, now the government, the, the schools are not able to absorb all of these children, so UNICEF or the education NGOs, they have to now create some sort of solution for these children in the camps. When they come illegally across the border, they're being shot at by Syrian snipers. Okay. So they're risking their lives to come here, and when they come here, there is nothing for them. They come with the clothes on their back, they have no, they have nothing. So they, often they leave their husbands behind in Syria, and they're arriving maybe a widow with seven or eight, ten children, and they can't pay the rent, they can't buy the food. You know, they can access the hospitals, but they've got no money to buy the medicine for the hospital. So, what happened here? Here's the Syrian camps. This is the beginning of the Syrian camps a few, couple years, a few years ago. I'm not allowed into this camp because I'm a white journalist, and the, the camp is full of Syrians who have basically run away from the people that are after them. The white journalists are photographing them and putting it into the news. Bad guy finds good guy, comes there, shoots them. As she was saying, they're sh actually snipers shooting them as they cross the border, mothers and children. So I'm standing outside waiting for my Jor Jordan, Jordanian photographer who is inside shooting from his hip. The guy who did the photograph of me in the beginning. What do you do? You need to do something. So my, my arms on my body, here's my tripod, turned on my, my video on my 1DX and just told her to talk. That's how prepared you have to be. And it, and it worked. Um, in the homes were of, of the, uh, the, the Syrians had come in into Jordan and they were in homes. Nobody wanted to, to let me into the homes. So, but I pushed. I said, hey, you know, this would be great. You know, made some other excuse. Get me into the home. Let me tell the story. They think that the people don't want you in there. But once you get in there, most wonderful people spend hours with them and got wonderful photographs. Um, she had just come over, one year, one week old baby. There's 16 people in this home. They don't want to stay there. They, they just can't stay, <laughs> they can't go to, back to Syria, they're going to kill. So it's it, the organization that I work with help these people while they're there. Just a, a whole family of just wonderful people. The, he was with the organization and he knew everybody. So that was one of my, uh, we call them fixers. Then we're into, um, uh, this was in Beirut, where the ICMC vents the refugees from, from the Middle East into the United States. And it takes about two years to do it. Because uh, they really, un, unlike our government right now, they vent these people like you wouldn't believe. You've got to go to the doctor nine times. And the only reason you go to the doctor nine times is to see if you lie. The first time you said a broken right leg, Three visits later, you said, no, it was a broken left leg. Well, wait a second. What are, you, are you telling the truth or not? So they really vent them. And, and there are people there that are, are working their tails off to live with the chance of, of being able to be moved. Um, so I was able to get into the homes and to, and to create. And from the ICMC, I created a book, which you'll see over here. And I gave it to them as a gift. And then they looked at the book, and you know, it was just in a PDF form, luckily. I looked at it and it says, who wrote the, the words in this? And I said, I took it off of your website. And they go, uh-oh, <laughs> the website was wrong. Nobody had corrected the website in two years. So after going back and forth, back and forth, I produced the book and I ended up selling 750 copies of the book to them. The profit from that allowed me to do this mission, to do other missions. So if you're not getting a direct payment, there are other ways of making you creating things which they can use 
and then that produces some money which you can then do your other work. I mean, he's, he's sitting there, I did an interview with him, he's sitting there saying that he's got some problem with his heart and, um, and he's finished. He's finished with life. And all he wants you to do is take care of these, these three here. I don't, care, I don't care about myself, just leave me alone. Just take care of these three, I'm gone. I have no idea what happened to him later, but um, in you'll meet desperation all over the place. Interesting one going into the West Bank. This little girl had a, a, bad, a bad kidney and they, they all have their x-rays, fix my kid, fix my kid. And I said to the doctor, I said, this, is, this kidney is really bad. He says, no, no, that's the good one. This one's bad. He told this father that he doesn't know if he can save your child, his child. Two hours later, he saved the child's life, and this is what I was able to do. If you don't stand, and, and I'm six foot two, so you can't miss me. If you don't stand in the OR room, if you don't stand right next to the patients, and you're outside chit-chatting, oh, I'm too tired, I'm, you're going to miss this. And this man, Palestinian, has his thoughts on life, being photographed by an American, his daughter being corrected by an American, it didn't matter. Not, nothing mattered except for the fact that this wonderful man saved my daughter and it was the most amazing thing that was no religion no hatred no nothing just love and this probably if we ran into this guy now he would still be there because he saved that child's life it was absolutely a, a, the most wonderful moment in my photography of course, you can't miss the, <laughs> just all over the place. Every place you, you turn, if you're, if you're looking, see with your eye, capture with your camera. And I hate to say it, the iPhone is a camera, the 1DX is a camera, the Leica is a camera, but they're actually Xerox machines of your vision. Count to 10, no, count to 10, no, uh, okay, I'm out. <laughs> because he's the anesthesiologist. The kid was not going down. <laughs> Unfortunately, in this whole, in, when, when, and, and you learn these things. Uh, the, the reddest hair kid, unfortunately, I have, I have it in color, but I liked it better than the black and white. Um, he had a, a hole in his spine, which wasn't allowing him uh, certain functions. And we could have fixed it. Three different days, we said to his parents, fast, he must fast. Okay, we're gonna fast. The next day, okay, did he fast? Yeah, he fasted. Well, did he have anything? Yeah, he had some rice. Now, wait a second, he's supposed to, well, that's fasting to them. Okay, so the next day, say, nothing. He keeps his mouth shut, nothing. Next day, did he fast? Yes, he fasted, but he, he had something here. The third day, same thing, we couldn't stop them because they didn't understand what fasting was medically. They were fasting, in their culture, they were fasting. And unfortunately, we weren't able, because if we had opened them up with all the food in it, we could have killed them. I, this is one of my favorite photographs because the, how do you look at your mother this way and how does mother look at the son this way? It's it just I it just think it's just an amazing uh, back and forth. And a wonderful little wonderful little girl, ready to die because her kidney's probably shot, and the other one's on its way out. This is the mother of the daughter of the father kissing. I don't know if everybody's seen the uh, Eugene Smith series on the uh, country doctor. This guy was like the country doctor. He was probably in his 
in his uh, about 36, one, one of these genius doctors with the bedside manner of just, you'd think, oh, this guy doesn't know anything. <laughs> he goes in and creates amazing things. And, and he had a stomach virus from eating something wrong, so he'd stand up here for four hours and sit down here and go, ah, oh, leave me alone, leave me alone. Next, get back up again. And again, nothing's going on, but look at the story this photograph is just telling. And just think of what went on. You know, the old thing is if, if that room could talk. So Smile, Smile Pakistan is an organization I created trying to get, raise money for Smile Bangladesh to come into Pakistan to do cleft work. Um, the head doctor who you saw in the beginning, Dr. Uh, Aziz, is his mother's Pakistani, his father's Bengali. Unfortunately, the, the Bengalis hate the Pakistanis. <laughs> and the Pakistanis hate the Bengalis. So getting into the country, so I went to, to, um, I went to Pakistan uh, in April on a test to see what happens. And the longer I stayed there, the bigger the circle of people that knew me grew. And by the time I was there, I was there for about nine days, ever, in the area that I was in, five different police departments wanted me to come in and register with them. Even though I went through two weeks of every connection in New York, to get my visa to Pakistan uh, was in, you'll, you'll find that also. Getting a visa to go to these countries. Oh, let's go to the country. Here's the airplane ticket. Now you got to get your visa. Now you got to get permission. How to do that can be daunting. Um, found out that if we bring in a group of 20 American doctors, it ain't going to work. But if we brought in um, Pakistani head doctor and a couple of Pakistani doctors from the United States making up the team we hopefully can get in. So it's a project that I'm working on. And what I found was a 55-year-old with a cleft, a young boy who had a bad cleft repair, another bad cleft repair. So I got different different types so we can turn it into a teaching mission instead of a repair mission a teaching mission that those doctors over there can then um, fix the children when we're not there but the photographs that I take can get money to help start this whole program so that was kind of the, the key to this I'm telling you the, the, these people had zero this room has got more, it just, if it was just chairs and more, behind those doors is their, uh, their house, which is bare, almost bare. And there's nothing wrong with the eyes. It's, a, it's a, uh, this makeup that they put on that they think that makes your eyelashes grow. <laughs> I don't think it does a darn bit of good. But if you remember, I don't know if I'm saying her name right, Natifi from, from Egypt, the, the queen, Nefertiti, Nefertiti with, the, with the big um, oh. marking around her eyes. The, uh, that was to keep the flies out of her eyes. It was a bug repellent. And I thought that that's what they were doing here because they have so many flies around their kids. This is a clinic. The cl he couldn't even give out aspirin, let alone fix anything. And it was just like there was just nothing. So back to that's kind of just a, uh, a slice of, of 50, 60,000 images. Um, and then the, back to locations, which the missions allow me to do. If you don't get paid for it and you're on the other side of the world, might as well go do something else. So I always add on, like I'm going to Sri Lanka and I've got a couple clients coming with me that will be embedded with the, uh, with the mission. Um, and it's uh, Camera Odysseys, which is a, a travel company that, I, that I've created. And so I'm taking 
uh, photographers into a medical mission, so we'll be embedded with them. And once we finish that, we will tour um, Sri Lanka and go into Nepal on the way home. Um, and it just, this is Pakistan, the probably four million uh, bricks that are being produced down in the field, brought up and fired in this big oven. China with, in southern China with the rice. Going 60 miles an hour down the road, hey, it happens. I love the city, cityscape. And then, I was supposed to show that one, but that was Bangladesh, China. And some of them are, some of the location stuff relates to, to the mission, but usually, usually not. It's just stuff that I'm able to pick up as I, as I roam around from point A to B. I don't know if anybody knows of Cartier-Bresant and uh, Picasso's with the, with the bread on the table. So I want to thank B&H. This is a wonderful um, event space. And uh, through APA, we hope to get other photographers to come in to talk about we uh, tons and tons of subjects to talk about. So um, you know, definitely keep an eye on the, the event space uh, calendar and, and come back. Um, oops, I, I am a board member with APA New York, which everybody should look into. It's a wonderful thing. We advocate for the photographers. We work for, for uh, uh, copyright. Um, we produce Proof Sheet Magazine, which is, you can see all the magazines on here. This is an organization that's, that's a nonprofit for photographers, run by photographers, and it's all volunteer. So if you want to get involved with APA, this is wonderful to get involved in because you, you come up with a project, and, if, and if, it, if the board approves of it, there's even funding for that project. And that's, we, you can look up here later, uh, Proof Sheet Magazine, I ended up producing Edit, editor and producer of the magazine, all on nonprofit because I loved the nonprofit and I was able to produce that. And then my travel company, which I do photographic workshops, is Camera Odysseys with an S, dot com. And I do photographic workshops around the world. Um, just as I said, with, I figured, how else are you going to get into, into your nonprofit work? Well, come on a, come on a, workshop with me and, and I'll show you firsthand. Because what I've talked about is, you know, some information, but every time I walk off the airplane, it's, I go, how come I didn't think of that? And I've been shooting for f over 40 years. So thank you very much for coming. And if there's any questions, uh, let me know.